Okay, all right. Okay. Um, so hello everybody and sorry for the technical problems that we are having today. And um, well, we are presenting the first bioinfo club of this um, of this season. Our guest today is Mark Harrison. He is a postdoctoral research associate and a principal investigator at the Molecular Evolution and Bioinformatics Group at the University of Münster in Germany. He did his, mas his uh, master in biology um, in the field of biodiversity at the Ruhr University um, in Bochum, Germany. And then uh, he has a PhD in evolutionary biology at the University of Leicester in the at the UK. And his thesis was about the influence of the specific expression on selection. Also, um, he um, his postdoc. Uh, and he has a postdoc at the Institute of Evolution and Biodiversity at the University of Münster. So actually at the same university where he is um, now being a lecturer. And today he's speaking about the investigating, um, so the topic is investigating the molecular footprints of insect sociality. So Mark, when, whenever you want, you can start your speech and again thank you so much for the um, technical problems of yeah, pro the no problem thank you for having me thank you for the introduction and the, the invitation to talk it's a pleasure to talk today um yeah i i i'm, I'm i'll be more talking about results of bioinformatics so i'm i would call myself more of a, an evolutionary biologist than a bioinformatician even though i I suppose I am a bioinformatician because I, I, I used lots of bioinformatic methods, but I'll be talking a bit about the results. And if you're interested in some of the techniques we've been using, we can you can ask some questions at the end. So when we're talking about the genomic footprints of sociality. There are two aspects here that I would like to talk about today. One is on the genomic signatures of the evolution of eusociality. So what marks are left behind in the genome um, along this uh, trajectory towards eusociality, but also the other way around. Once uh, the actual, if if a species has a, a eusocial lifestyle, what kind of effect can we expect that to have on the genome, or, uh, and will we be able to see some footprints caused by a uh, uh, eusocial lifestyle in the genome? Right. First, to to define what eusociality is. Um, usually combines um, at least three um, traits. One of them is a reproductive division of labor. So you have one or few individuals that are responsible for the uh, reproduction, whereas the rest are um, sterile and uh, work for the for the for the colony. And then you have cooperative brood care, meaning um, it's not only the parents, well, actually, a lot of the time, it's not the parent at all who, who, who takes care of the brood, but in fact, it's a cooperative care of the brood, in most cases from, from siblings. And you have overlapping generations within one colony. And the most famous groups are, I would say, within Hymenopteras, where you have uh, some wasps and some bees. We've got a bumblebee here. Are you social? All ants are you social. But actually, most Hymenopteran species are solitary. Whereas all termites, which we have here on the left, are eusocial and they're um, nestled within Blattodea, so their uh, nearest ancestors or their nearest um, relatives, I should say, sorry, are cockroaches. So here we have I at least four independent um, evolutionary origins of sociality within Hymenoptera and then an independent one in termites. There are also a couple of others we can mention within the insects. So we have in, in the beetles, we have um, the ambrosia beetles, or uh, at least one species is uh, truly eusocial. And then there's some sociality in, in some thrips, in some thrips and some aphid species. But today I'll be concentrating on Hymenoptera and termites. So there is some there have been some studies on on what what to expect in the genome what what kind of molecular signatures you might you might see that accompany the evolution of sociality 
And uh, if we go back to, to the origins of sociality, so simple sociality, uh, where um, maybe some additional care behavior emerges. So not only parental care, but maybe also alloparental care. So care from, from uh, siblings, for example, caring for the brood. This, this is generally behavior which already exists in, in some context, but is uh, being expressed in a different context. So here you would expect to see the expression of existing genes to change in some way. So you you would in the in the genome you would maybe expect to see uh, some evidence for for changes or uh, evolution of, of of transcriptional regulation. Now, as um, more social traits accumulate and social complexity increases, um, the the castes diverge. So you get more uh, more distinct castes within a species. So you have the the workers and the queen morphs, for example, which which diverge in not only in behavior but also in mor morphology. As this as this happens, you would expect to see. Um, uh, some evidence of positive selection working on on protein, so protein evolution, and uh, th there are also these ideas that uh, new genes may arise or become more important there when when these new um, um, new morphs um, um, evolve. So you have the soldier, which is a, a completely new um, trait, for example, and and there have been a couple of studies which uh, tend to support these ideas. And um, so I've, I've named three studies here. These are uh, this similar et al was a study on ants and Kapai et al on, on bees. That's this figure you can see here, but there's also one here, uh, a more recent one on bees. And in all of these studies, they found with increasing social complexity, increasing uh, transcription regulation. So that fulfills the first expectation. So in, in the ant study, they found a divergence of regulatory elements, uh, non-coding RNA and also transcription factor binding sites. In another study, they found an increasing number of transcription factors. And in, in this figure here, we see an increasing uh, number of genes which are predicted to be methylated with increasing uh, sociality. And, th and the next expectation is the adaptive evolution to increase with increasing social uh, complexity. And this has been shown in, in several studies. And here's a nice example from, from a recent one from 2021, yeah, in, in bees. And they, and they had a look at which gene families were evolving adaptively in, in several different species, bee species with, with different levels of social complexity. And they found that the largest number of gene families which were uh, evolving adaptively, so expanding, were found in um, the more advanced eusocial species. And the same was the case for uh, gene family, uh, for um, numbers of proteins with um, significant positive selection. And then the, the more simple species had uh, fewer, uh, fewer families, uh, gene families evolving adaptively. And um, there were expansions in quite often reported in, in certain uh, gene families, for example, olfactory receptors. So uh, genes related to chemical communication, which is important in, in the more complex societies, lipid metabolism and, and some other things. And there's also evidence for taxonomically restricted genes becoming more important with increased uh, sociality. So all of these three expectations, which were postulated by Rehan and Toth, have quite a bit of support uh, in Hymenoptera, at least. So we were interested in seeing if we if we find something similar in in termites. Um, but first of all, I'll just introduce you to sociality in the group of Blattodea. So I have three cockroach species named here. These are the ones for which uh, genomes exist. And uh, at some stage, subsociality arose. Well, it arose several times, but um, most interestingly for us here at, um, at the root of, of the wood roaches, which are the sister group to the termites, they are subsocial wood feeders, so they have a very similar ecology to lower termites. 
um, subsocial. It means that they, the parents care for the brood and help them uh, processing the wood. And then you have the, uh, all of the termites are eusocial, but the lower termites um, have more simple societies. They, they generally live in wood, so they're not, um, they don't forage. And they quite and most often have um, totipotent workers, meaning that they 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 still care for the brood, but there is uh, they still have the potential to become reproductive and either uh, leave the nest or, or well they have the potential to replace the queen if necessary. And then you have the higher termites, which uh, live in these m much larger, more complex colonies, and they um, they they forage, and their workers are sterile. I've got three traits here that we that I'm looking at in a in a project I'm I'm working on. One is is care care behavior. So you have no care, parental care, and alloparental care. You've got the, the existence of soldiers, which is the definition of eusociality in this case. So you have these sterile individuals, and we also think it's important to include um, the worker sterility. Right, so a few years ago, we worked on this project when we um, sequenced and assembled the third termite genome and the first cockroach genome. Here's the cockroach genome and the three termite genomes um, in uh, comparatively with, with 20, um, a total of 20 insect species. Um, we wanted to see whether we'd find um, similar things to what had already been found in, in Hymenoptera. Um, termites are particularly interesting because eusociality evolved independently from very different origins because these are uh, hemimetabolites, not holometabolites like the Hymenoptera. Um, and we found some similarities. I mean, we, we as in Hymenoptera, we found um, evidence for increasing transcriptional regulation with increasing sociality. So here we have we don't need to go into this in too much detail, but the, these these plots here show the distribution of, of predicted methylation. So it's a, um, a histogram of the uh, methylation by gene, and we see it's bimodal. And uh, this this so there appear to be two categories of genes within the termites. One one category is uh, strongly methylated, and the other category is not methylated, and it appears it's the uh, lower methylated genes. Uh, which are caste biased. And we also found um, a lot of evolution of, of transcription factors, especially zinc finger gene families, which um, which were enriched for queen bias genes. So they're possibly important for the regulation of, of queen bias genes. So played an important role in the evolution of, uh, of castes. And of course, we also saw large changes in gene expression compared to the solitary cockroach. So the, one interesting finding was that um, whereas odorant receptors, odorant receptor, this, this is a, a sketch of an odorant receptor on the right, um, down at the bottom, bottom right, the, the, these are important um, chemo receptors, so important for perception of chemical cues, and um, especially for uh, chemical communication in eusocial hymenoptera, so they're expanded in eusocial hymenoptera. These these didn't seem to be important at all in termites. In fact, there are very few, the ones that are coloured here, these are the, the ones that we found in the termites, or the cockroaches, and everything in grey was in the other species we looked into. In fact, we found another group of chemoreceptors completely unrelated to the odorant receptors, the inotropic receptors, to be really important in Blattodea. So they were strongly expanded in the cockroaches, um, reduced again in the termites, a few are in the termites, but they're still very numerous compared to other insect species. So these seem to be really important for, for this clade and possibly replace the role of odorant receptors here. Um, interesting, we found local expansions of these odorant receptors in the higher termite, uh, Macrotomus natalensis. This is one that builds these really large uh, complex colonies. And we found evidence for positive selection, especially within this um, ligand binding lobe, in the ligand binding lobe here, uh, which is important for sensing uh, chemical cues. So uh, adaptive evolution here would indicate that these are adapting to uh, different uh, specificities of different chemical cues. And we also find cast specific expression of these uh, inotropic receptors indicating they're important for different tasks in the colony and 
for example, for, for foraging, you would need uh, different types of inotropic receptors, but also for colony communication. Something uh, new compared to Hymenoptera and, and quite exciting is that the transposable elements seem to have played a role in the evolution of termites. So T, uh, TEs are very abundant in Batidia, less uh, more so than in, in Hymenoptera. And we, although we found that most gene families were contracted in termites, and not expanded, so we were quite surprised by that. The gene families that were expanded in the termites compared to uh, outgroups, solitary outgroups, were enriched for transposable elements in the flanking regions, which indicates that the TEs uh, facilitated the expansions of these gene families, which were important for the evolution of, of termites. So like I say, we, we found an overall reduction in the genome and also in the proteome size. Uh, so here's here's the, um, pointed to the wrong screen, here's, here's the, the cockroach proteome and the genome and uh, the termites, much smaller and much smaller proteome. And we believe this may be related to a specialization, an ecological specialization rather than anything related to uh, sociality. And something more recent, we've had a look at domain rearrangements and we find at the root of the termites here, but also where true workers, so sterile workers evolved for the first time in termites, we found major uh, domain rearrangements. So domains are the functional units within a protein, and then you have several, one or, or many domains in a protein, and uh, their arrangement is important for the function of the protein. And these can be, uh, evolutionary timescales can be rearranged and so alter the function of a protein. So it's, of course, it's interesting and important to have a look at um, expansions of gene families and also um, sequence evolution of proteins. But we thought it's also, also important to have a look at domain rearrangements to um, see how uh, functional novelty arises and how that can be linked to sociality. And we found uh, some interesting functions here related to the evolution of sociality in these rearranged proteins. And um, they were also um, enriched for cast bias genes, so probably important for the evolution of cast, casts. Right, so to, to compare briefly between Hymenoptera and Isoptera, the, um, the evolution of sociality, there are some similarities, so increasing transcriptional regulation with increasing social complexity, adaptive evolution of chemoreceptors, but there are lots of uh, clade-specific um, differences, which I, th I think are quite important. So we're still really looking for these major um, signatures or general signatures of, of sociality. And um, we'll talk a bit later on, on where I, I, how I think I might be able to find them. But onto the second topic, this is the effects of sociality itself on the genome. So with increasing sociality, um, uh, increasing social complexity, sorry, the um, the affected population size decreases for two reasons. One reason is that the uh, with uh, the more socially complex the species, the the more sterile the workers, so the less chance the workers will actually have to reproduce, and also the size of the colony increases. So in the the more social socially complex species, you have very large colonies and very very few, relatively few, right? So one out of hundreds or thousands are actually reproductive. So you have a, a, a decreasing affected population size. And with that, you have a, an increasing uh, influence of, of drift. And uh, so you have, it, you would expect to see a decreasing uh, um, selection efficiency with increasing social complexity. And we should be able to see that in the genomes. And we do see it. This is a study by Imrit et al from 2020. And here they have, um, if nicely um, labeled species uh, describe social complexity based on the uh, the number of workers in a colony. I right, said so the more socially complex are over here in red, and the um, and the solitary species they have zero workers, so they're right over here. And this is a measure for um, uh, selection strength, so purifying selection, and we see a negative. Correlation. So this is what we would expect, right? So, so selection efficiency decreases with increasing complexity. And this is likely linked to effective population size. 
This hadn't been done before for um, termites, so we decided to look into it. I had a couple of students working on it. So we first used a measure called DNDS. And for those who don't know what DNDS is, I'll, I'll try to describe it briefly. So DS is the rate of, of substitutions at synonymous sites. These, these are nucleotide substitutions in, in DNA, which do not, so encoding DNA, sorry, which do not uh, change the amino acid. So it's used as a, an estimation of the mutation rate, the new, neutral mutation rate. And DN would be substitutions, um, proportions of, or a rate of substitutions which um, do change amino acids, so non-synonymous. Now, if, the, um, if, if, if a protein is evolving under neutral evolution, you would expect um, the, uh, the non-synonymous rate of substitutions be, to be similar to the um, synonymous substitution rate. Right? So that there you would have a, so dn divided by ds would give you a value around one. Um, for values closer to zero, that, that means that the, the, the protein sequence is constrained, it's not changing, and mutations are not uh, are being removed, so you have strong purifying selection. And the larger uh, DNDS gets above one, um, the stronger uh, positive selection is working on the protein. And here we have... Um, a tree of, of some blattidaean and, and a couple of outgroups down here. So we have three uh, non-social cockroaches, five termites, two of these are lower termites, and then we have lower termites with true workers, and we have a higher termite. So the, um, the true workers evolved here at the root of the top three termites. And we do indeed see that DNDS increases with uh, social complexity. And um, so an increasing DNDS still, is still lower than one. So overall purifying selection is dominant here, but it seems to be less, less important in, in, the, in, the social, uh, in the socially complex termites, which is sort of what we were expecting. This would indicate we have um, purifying selection is getting weaker with the social complexity. But just to be sure that that's not due to some sites within those proteins under positive selection, we did a further test um, called RELAX, where we, we check whether a genes are, um, the, the selection on genes is intensifying or relaxing within uh, the social branches compared to uh, the non-social branches. And anything uh, lower than zero would indicate a relaxation of selection within the social branches, and anything greater than zero, an intensification of selection. And as you can see here, we have a massive peak here to the left of zero. So most genes um, are under weaker selection compared to um, the solitary um, branches. And here are the functions linked to those. Um, which we we don't we're finding it difficult to interpret at the moment, but uh, very interesting for us also is this this lump here on the right. So there are a few genes which are under intensified selection uh, in social branches compared to non-social branches, and these these genes we had a look into them, and, and this intensification is positive selection. So uh, they're, they're experiencing increased positive selection in the termites compared to the, the cockroaches. And these are all, all have functions related to development, which, is, which we find quite exciting. So tube development, appendage development, so things to do with uh, morphology and, and development, which is sort of what you would expect when these new casts emerge, the, the sterile, sterile workers. So we need to look more closely at these genes which are involved there. We had a look at so, so there are a few genes evolving adaptively with increasing sociality, and we found exactly two that we were, were evolving on a positive selection here at the root of termites and here uh, where the, uh, the true workers, the sterile workers evolved. And uh, yeah, we're not quite sure what they do yet. This, uh, we, we've got some experiments lined up to try and understand what those two enzymes are doing, but we would expect that they're they are pretty important for the evolution of casts in, in termites. Right, moving on swiftly. Um, so the effects of sociality on the genome. 
So apart from um, sociality itself leading to a reduction in affected population size, there are also other, other factors we need to consider when thinking about the effect of sociality on, on the genome. So you have these two, especially in the higher, uh, the more socially complex species, you have these two very divergent phenotypes. So you have the workers, um, you also have soldiers, but let's concentrate on the workers for now. They have uh, a broad range of tasks and, uh, of course, different different selection regimes, which they're uh, subject to because they, they go out, they forage, they have a lot of risks. They also care for the brood. They have all of these different um, skills and, and functions, whereas the queen is sheltered and protected and uh, probably also sheltered somewhat from selection and only has to reproduce. So a much smaller range of, of, of selective constraints. However, selection is direct on the queen. So uh, any kind of mutation which has uh, an effect on the fitness of the queen will, will get, um, the, the selection will, will, will have a direct effect on, on the next generation. Whereas the, any mutations within, within workers will not be inherited. So the selection is direct, indirect on, on workers via the fitness of the colony, which then indirectly affects the fitness of the queen. So we would expect, because of all of these different aspects, variation in the mutational load um, throughout um, social genomes. We looked into this, we, 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 we compared um, caste biased genes between, um, well, uh, caste bias with worker biased genes and non biased genes, expecting a difference in selection in four different termite species and found no differences. And in, in, in a parallel study, well, slightly before ours in, in Hymenoptera, they also found no difference. So selection is not that much. So, so one of the expectations was that direct selection is much stronger than indirect selection or much more efficient. So you would expect to see uh, stronger selection on, on worker bias, on queen bias genes and worker bias genes. And this is not the case. So maybe there's some compensatory things going on there. So that selection overall seems to be relatively similar. However, now a new uh, study sees a slightly different uh, picture because now we're not only looking at um, genes which are cast biased within a species, but genes which are cast biased in several species, but have a consistent bias. So a gene which is, uh, we, we would only label a gene as queen biased if it's queen biased in at least two species. So in the higher termite and one other species, but it's not worker biased in any other. So it's consistently, um, uh, has a consistent bias across species. And a worker biased gene correspondingly would be a gene which is worker biased in at least two species and not queen biased in any other species. And when we do this, we see a difference between queen and worker biased genes, which we didn't see here, we see here. And it's possibly the opposite of what some would expect. We see um, weaker selection on queen biased genes than worker biased genes. Um, we're still working out what this is because strangely, we also see the pattern when we look at um, non-social species. So if we look at the orthologs, so the comparisons here are all, the DNDS is, is greater on the left than on the right on all of the branches. So if we look at the orthologs of these queen bias genes in, in non-social species, we also see weaker selection. So it appears that these genes are already under weaker selection in the ancestors, but also in, in other species, in extant species. And this is something we're, we're looking into at the moment. So where to next? Something that I, I, I really want to uh, look into and focus on now, we've, we've done some work on the termites. We're still continuing on the termites. And we're, we'll be looking into sociality in, in beetles, but it'd be nice to try and find some global genomic signatures of eusociality. So some of those things I've been talking about, the expectations of, of finding some similarities between social genomes. Um, I want to try and start looking for those, those patterns. So the idea is, well, first of all, we need some broad uh, species sampling across different groups, different origins of sociality. So not only hymenoptera and termites, also some beetles in there, maybe some thrips, maybe also venture outside of the insects. And then the question is, which properties do we need to look at? 
So I'm, I'm not thinking about particular genes. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the, the effects of sociality on the genome, some kind of imprint in the genome, which is not necessarily related to genes or gene functions, uh, possibly more to the regulation of genes and overall the um, just the shape and structure of the, of the, of the genomic sequence. For example, we can look at uh, Kama frequencies and their distributions that may in different genomic regions that that may give us some idea of what's happening in regular in, in transcript in um, transcriptional regulation, for example. And then ultimately, it'd be interesting to see when a genome is classifiable or what level of social complexity is it already possible to detect subsociality for example or is it only detectable once you have truly sterile workers and large large colonies um i've been working on this and um have some preliminary results which already seem quite promising so i had it um did some machine learning um on a data set where i have five termite genomes there are only five termite genomes available so that's all i took and then to keep it balanced i i took five eusocial hymenopteran genomes and 10 non-social genomes from all across insects and then i had a look at um, hexamere frequencies at different genomic regions and i trained the algorithm on 50% of the data and tested on the other 50%. And in each of these two sets, these two portions of the data, I had five social and five non-social species. And each time, and I repeated it uh, several hundreds of times, each time randomly sampling the, um, the combinations of social and non-social species. And the classification accuracy is pretty precise in some of the regions but first I'd like to talk about the uh, the exons so so Kama frequencies in exons cannot be classified and this is what I I, I kind of hoped for because this indicates that the uh, the algorithm is not just um, classifying genomic features based on um, orthology right so it's not just identifying for example a termite genome and putting it in with the termites because that's what it would do if it would do most most strongly with with exonic regions but it's actually performing best in the five prime and three prime flanking regions of genes um where you would expect to see very little orthology between species and here we're seeing um uh, some patterns that, that can be identified in uh, and different uh, be used to differentiate between social and non-social species uh, this is something uh, um I want to be working on in the future and um, something I'm developing at the moment and I will in the near future be looking to recruit a data scientist so if you're looking for a, a new challenge um, watch this space and uh, sometime in the near future you may see a vacancy uh, come up in my group I'd be interested to uh, talk to some people about that that's it for now there are lots of people i'd like to thank hundreds of people who have worked on all of these projects and i'd also like to thank you for your attention and i'm happy to take any questions okay so um thank you again thank you so much uh, mark to your presentation it was really um, really interesting and well also um thank you for letting us know that maybe you are also looking for uh, new people. Uh, well, now we are going to um, uh, to look at the questions that we have uh, in the chat. And actually, um, well, uh, Ivan is is asking why why looking for genomic footprints with machine learning? Like, why is that so interesting? Why, why is it interesting to look for genomic footprints? Uh, yeah, yeah, with machine learning. With, with what, sorry? Machine learning. Ah, with machine learning, yeah. That's a good question. Right. Um, well, first of all, well, with, with the standard techniques that we've been using in comparative genomics, we've not been able to find anything so far. And and the, the reason I, I want to use machine learning is I have, I just have, 
this feeling there must be something there. We're just not quite sure exactly where to look. And I'm sure there are there are also some other methods. I mean, we could also just directly look at the um, motives within uh, regulatory regions. But I just don't believe that the motives themselves, like sequence motives, will be conserved. So it would be really difficult to find uh, some patterns there. Um, yeah, basically, it's, it's looking for that for those patterns and that I expect to be there. It's just the fact that at the moment we don't know exactly where to look. It'd be, and um, yeah, and I just find, um, apart from that, I just find machine learning exciting. And that's uh, something I'd like to look look into a bit more and uh, use these tools to, to help us find where to look, basically. And um, like, are you considering using more supervised methods or unsupervised methods or both, both of them? Yeah. Both, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, I mean, I don't only want just just black box methods, of course. I mean, we start off with some neural networks, which will maybe have high precision just to give us an idea of whether it's worth working on it further. But then we will also need to use some other, other methods where we can actually uh, find which which factors are most, most informative. Okay, thank you so much. Um... Daniel is asking, what measure have you used to, to measure the performance of the models? Ah, the, the performance of the models of the, the the last thing we were talking about, the machine learning. Yeah, I think so. Uh, this, is, this is very rudimentary. It's very, very basic. And it's um, just something I'm working on for a proposal. And at the moment, we're just looking at the um, the accuracy of the classification. I'm not sure if that okay. answers the question. We do we did test some of the parameters, and I can't remember exactly what I used, but they were very standard methods and very rough so far. Okay, then uh, I have also um, another question regarding. So one of the slides you you said that you predicted the methylation patterns. How actually? I mean, I have never um, done anything like that, like predicting methylation. So how would you actually do that? I mean, first of all, we would prefer to have bisulfite sequencing or some other kind of technology which actually measures the methylation directly, right? But that, if that's not available, there's a there's a there's a way of predicting it based on. So when um, a cytosine is methylated in the CPG context, it often mutates to, and I always forget what it mutates to. But anyway, mutates to. So a methylated cytosine often gets. Um, falsely paired in, in um, replication, so you get this mutation. Okay. I want to say to a T, and I can't remember. So, so what, what you do is you, uh, you look for, um, you, you compare the observed CPGs to what you would expect. So you count all of the Cs and all of the Gs, and then you uh, calculate what you, how many CPGs you would expect to see. And then if, if, if a gene is strongly methylated, the uh, CPGs are depleted. Okay. And it, cor it correlates quite well with uh, true methylation. Okay, thank you. Um, then David is asking, what would be the species of the eusocial beetle? Yeah, so there's one, there is one um, um, ambrosia beetle. So these are weevils. So you have the group of weevils, and then within the weevils, you have some bark beetles. This is really interesting because they also feed on wood, like the termites, so a similar ecology. And some of those have, well, I think all bark, bark beetles are at least subsocial. And then there are, uh, there's one, Ambrosia, they're called ambrosia beetles because they also have these uh, this ambrosia fungus which they farm. So they have the also have that which is similar to some ant and termite species. And then there is so far only one known species which is truly. So there's there's one once there are a couple of species where they have some alloparental care. So they have the siblings caring for the brood as well. But there's only one truly eusocial species, and that is. Holstro platypus something, an Australian species. 
Okay, and um, also he asked whether it would be included in these results for cockroaches and termites. If it would be included. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah. the eusocial. Yes, so yes. Well, I mean, well, we, I, I'm going to have, so I, the, the termite project is running now. So, I mean, the, the, the results I presented there from an old project, but we are, we're sequencing and assembling termite genomes right now. And I have a PhD student who's working on that, on a, a much better data set, trying to understand the evolution of sociality in termites. And I have another para, parallel project starting in November. I already have a PhD student who's going to be working on that for, in. Uh, understanding the evolution of sociality in these beetles. And then we're going to try and compare and see if we see anything convergent. And then later on, bring everything together with, with some kind of machine learning or, or whatever techniques to try and find some convergent patterns across all origins of sociality, you sociality. So yes, we're going to keep them separate first, but then we're going to combine things. Okay, and also um, another question that I have is, um, what else could be causing that the observed, um, so the observed genomic patterns apart from the eusociality? Yeah, this is something that we um, that we we really need to be careful about, and we're often blinded by what our goal is, right? So the goal is to try and understand new sociality, but then there are a lot of confounding factors that we need to really be careful about. The problem with termites is is that um, if we only have a look at the termites and compare them to most cockroaches, there's a confounding factor of ecology. So at the uh, base, or, so so the base of termites are all wood feeders. So a lot of the patterns we'll be seeing in the in the termite genomes is likely or it will be related to this change in ecology, so the change in feeding and and so on. And it's only by comparing across different origins of sociality can we control for that. So it's important, I suppose, just to um, put in as many different, just to describe the phenotypes and the ecology as as detailed as possible. Okay, and also, uh, well, I guess. I don't know uh, to which point it is difficult or, or maybe not so tricky to measure these uh, phenotypes, right? Like to give it a, a number to it. That's what we need to do. I mean, so far it's been... It's been difficult. Well, so far, we've not had the data. Now, now the data's coming in. I mean, there are no excuses now. We're getting all the genomes in, and uh, soon we'll be able to do some really detailed analyses on the genomes. So we'll be able to um, measure many different molecular aspects, and it's important to relate that to the to the phenotype. And, and it's, of course, not enough just to say the social or not social or yeah. or just giving it a number from zero to two or whatever. So what we need to do is try, and eusociality is a complex trait. So we need to try and look at as many different traits as possible and describe them as, in as much detail as possible. Some of them will just be categorical. I mean, it could be uh, uh, presence or absence of sterile workers. But another one, a numeric a variable would be, for example, uh, colony size. Um, but also all the other phenotypic traits I was talking about, we need to include in there that are not necessarily uh, uh, connected to sociality. So yeah, for that, I need to work together with all of the um, organismal experts, which is what we do. And we're just trying to describe them as best we can. Mm -hmm. Well, with luck, with it, I'm sure you Thank will. You. You will do it great. Okay, so I think there are no more questions here in the chat. So, well, we are finishing for today. Thank you so much again, Mark, really for being uh, today here with us and for giving this super interesting speech. It was great to see you again after so much time. And um, well, now we are, we are sharing our social uh, networks here in the in the screen, so you can you can follow us. And then, well, we do many different activities, and so we have the bioinfo clubs. We have also uh, 
mini tutorials. Uh, we have also, um, well, we are thinking of uh, of doing a podcast for this for this year, which is a new activity that we are planning. So yeah, uh, also we have some um, job uh, opportunities. So we um, we share some job opportunities from different institutes and universities. So yeah, just uh, follow us if you are interested in all of this content. And thank you so much again, and see you next uh, next month, the third um, Tuesday of each month with the next Bioinfo Club. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.